right, I guess I'm ready to roll. Like she said, my name's Randy Stufflebeam, and uh, I have a website uh, called Constitutionally Correct. Now, I'm a retired Marine, and as a Marine, I found that oftentimes I was uh, lacking in skills of being politically correct. And uh, pretty much that's just been a, a way of life for me. Uh, being politically correct has never been one of my fortes. I usually just kind of say things out, you know. Uh, and, and being politically correct a lot of times takes tact. And uh, tact is something that I'm really ch continuing to try to work on, you know. Um, I don't know if you know what the, in the Marine Corps we used to say the definition of tact is to be able to tell somebody to go to hell and have them happy they're on their way. <laughs> and uh, my, for me and my personality, for some reason, I would, my heart was always in the right place. I'd tell somebody, you know, basically, metaphorically, go to heaven, and they would be mad at me. So this whole political correctness never worked. But I tell you what, as I retired from the Marine Corps, understanding that I put my life on the line for 22 and a half years with an oath to s protect and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and I got out and discovered that, uh, for the most part, our government has betrayed that to 22 years of service. And um, so I got to realizing I really don't know that much about the Constitution. And so I started uh, researching, I started studying, and I started going back to the founding documents. And so I have a website called Constitutionally Correct. While I'm not politically correct, I always want to be constitutionally correct. And I've just started a new section on there called <laughs> The Works, where it is going to be a place where you can go and take a look at all the founding documents, take a look at what our, foundings, our founding fathers wrote, the complete works of uh, John Adams, the complete works of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. Right now, um, I've started working on the complete works of Alexis de Tocqueville. Are you anybody familiar with who, they, who he is? Go ahead. Who is he? He's a Frenchman who came here to see how come America works. Yeah. <laughs> and how yeah. come it, it didn't work in France. Yeah. Call, and he wrote a book called Democracy in America. And uh, you know what else he said? He said that democracy is going to or this thing's going to work fine for America until the voters learn to vote themselves a largesse out of the public treasury. Absolutely. And what's interesting about this is when you start reading what the founding fathers actually said, when you actually read read their original writings, and when you see with your own eyes what they really said, you will find that what we are being told in the United States of America is not what they said. One of the things that's real interesting and you'll discover, in fact, uh, this kind of is segues into the title of my speech. Things that you know that just aren't so. It ain't what a man don't know that makes him a fool. It's what he does know that just ain't so. And we find that uh, prevalent throughout the United States these days. Things that people know that just aren't so. For instance, the United States is a democracy. We are a republic. And let me get some notes, because i got a, bunch, uh, a few of these things. How about, and this was real interesting, uh, how many of you remember when uh, John Roberts, the Chief Justice of the United States, uh, was, was uh, accepting his nomination from Bush? Anybody see that speech that he gave? Well, even John Roberts uh, talked about the United States as being a democracy. And what's real interesting is how about Roe v. Wade is settled law? One of the things that John Roberts said, Roe v. Wade is settled law. It's not settled law, it's a court case, a decision on one case, and yet it has become the law of the land. One of those things, you know, J-A-S, it just ain't so. J-A-S. Um, how about this one? The First Amendment 
provides for a separation of church and state? No. Just ain't so. <laughs> it just ain't so. <coughs> How about Obama is an American president? <laughs> we all know that. Yes. <laughs> it just ain't so. Here's one. Now I might start stepping on some toes, so just be aware. How about uh, Ronner is pro life? <laughs> just ain't so. He doesn't even say that, does he? No. no. But no, but plenty of other people are saying it for oh. him. Plenty of other people are trying to say it for him. How many times have we seen that? In fact, it was said about John Roberts exactly the same way, Chief Justice. He never declared he was pro-life. He declared his wife was pro-life. So everybody else is saying, John Roberts is pro-life. He's pro-life. Man, it just ain't so. Okay, here's one that may just really step on some toes. Democrats and Republicans are two separate parties. <laughs> Yeah, we already established that one. You already went through that, huh? Okay, so your toes are pretty safe. Um, how about this one? This one might uh, cause you to think a little bit. The president or Congress, any, wait, have I got any veterans out here besides myself? Okay, all right. I'm not going to embarrass you because I'm going to ask, I'm going to sit. The president or Congress has the authority to appoint officers in the Army and in the Air Force. Who appoints them? They enlist. The Congress. Congress. They join. No. The military. Let's see what the Constitution has to say about that. <laughs> because every time I go out and ask this question, most veterans, when I ask who has the authority to appoint officers, officers now, this is an officer issue, how many people come up with anything other than president? or Congress. And I noticed that some of you are like, um, is it the president or is it Congress? Well, let's, let, let's see what the Constitution actually says about it. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 16. And this is one of the powers of Congress. This is one of the mandated, not suggested, not requested, one of the mandated powers of Congress. One of those things that Congress is supposed to do, right? Here's what it says. To provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia. Now, you got to remember that back in the good old days of our founding fathers, militia, military, all of that was synonymous. It was one thing. It wasn't, we got this idea that today militia, <laughs> all right, is what? It's a state. Renegades. It's only us. Well, that's right. People are getting the idea that a militia is a bunch of renegades. But do you know that Article 12 of the Illinois State Constitution, the title is Militia? And the very first paragraph is a definition of who are members of the Illinois State Militia. Anybody want to take a stab at who it is? All of us. I know. Every single one of us. Yes. No, it does Believe not give an age. Uh -uh. No. Every able bodied person. 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 Person, male or female. Person. People, you know, it ain't what a man don't know that makes him a fool. It's what he does know that just ain't so. We need to be absolutely sure of what our documents say in these definitions. It's important. But it goes on. It says, and for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States. And now, does that sound like the military to you? The military is employed by the United States, right? Here's the key. Here's the key in the middle of this clause. Reserving to the states respectively the appointment of officers. Who's responsible for appointing the officers in the Army and the Air Force? Hello? Constitution right here. All you got to do is read it. And then it says the authority of training the militia according to the discipline prescribed by Congress. 
Now, prior to World War II, now here's why it's so important to understand the issue of declaring war. People think it's just declare war so that our enemies know that we're coming after them. It has nothing to do with that. We're coming after them anyway, whether they know it or not. When we declare war, there's certain things that have to happen. The states were responsible for maintaining the personnel of the militia. And back then, prior to the 17th Amendment, senators actually represented the states. It's important to understand how all these pieces of the puzzle fit together the way that our founding fathers brilliantly put this together. Back then, when you declared war, what happened was it was the Congress, the House of Representatives, and then the senators who put together this <coughs> declaration and because the senators actually represented the states, it was then, in the mentality of things, that they were then putting the state's resources of the military at the federal government's disposal. Let me say that in a different way. In other words, when you declared war, the states who were maintaining the personnel, the militia, were then encapsulated, was then taken up by the federal government to defend these United States of America, to go to war. It was the state's responsibility to maintain the personnel. Now, why? And people will say, well, but if, if we were trying to do that today, you know, Illinois would be have a militia one way, and Indiana would have it a different way, and Ohio would have it a different way. And there, you know, you just couldn't put it together. Number one. As a Marine, I fought next to the Royal Marines. I fought next with the Rock Marines, the Republic of Korea Marines. Now, did we have anything? Our weapons were different. Our methodology were different. And yet we were able to fight together and we couldn't do it if we were states? Come on! Think about these things. People, when you know, they say this stuff, it just, the reality of things just blow you away. The only thing, now, I was a Marine, and my appointment as a gunnery sergeant in the United States of the Marine Corps did come through the federal government. It was appropriate because we are a department of the Navy. The Navy, according to the Constitution, is a legitimate federal force. Why? Because, you know, even the landlocked states should have a part of you know, providing for the Navy that protects our coastline. So that makes sense. But the Army, our founding fathers were absolutely abhorrently afraid of a central government that had the ability to utilize a military force in any old way they seemed fit to do. And consequently, since World War II, they've been able to do it. Number one, because they have the money to do it, because of the 16th Amendment. And because of the Butler versus the United States in 1936, they have the ability to spend their money on whatever they want. So they've been able to monetarily keep a military force in place because the senators no longer represent the states and say, hold on, we're done with the war. We want our people back to our states. See how things have gone completely ballistic. Now, one of the other things that is happening is that the Constitution provides for a convention of states. Has anybody heard that? Have you heard it? Article 5. That's right. But nowhere in Article 5 do you see the language saying a convention of states. Interestingly, Article 5, and I'll read it to you. The Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution, or on the application of legislatures of two-thirds of the st several states shall call a convention for the purpose of proposing amendments, which, in either case, whether it's Congress doing it or the, you know, the states having applied for this convention, so Congress or convention, which in either case shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this Constitution 
when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states, or by conventions in three-fourths thereof, as the one or the other mode of ratification may be proposed by Congress, provided that no amendment which may be made prior to year one, let's see, prior to year 1808, in other words, 1808, shall in any manner affect the first and fourth clauses in the ninth section of the first article, which obviously that doesn't really apply to us now, but it was a, a, a stipulation when they put Article 5 in for when they ratified the Constitution, and that no state without its consent shall be deprived of its equal suffrage of the state. Now I will tell you there are many reasons, and people will say and claim that um, those who support it will say, Randy, you're just fear-mongering. Let me tell you, I am afraid. I am afraid of what will happen if this United States has a convention of states, a constitutional convention, a convention to propose amendments, whatever you want to call it, there's only one thing that the Constitution provides for in Article 5, and that is a convention. Number two, a lot of them say, well, you know, we're going to elect delegates and we're going to, you know, make sure that good people are in process of being delegates to this convention. Well, guess what? According to Article 5, get back here, um, the mode of ratification, well, that, that goes on to something else. The, the Article 5 does not provide for how delegates shall be proposed or elected or appointed to this convention. Number one, it, it doesn't exist in Article 5. So that's one of those things where, in fact, I got to tell you, with, with, with the people that are supporting the convention of states and saying this is what's going to happen and this is what's going to happen and we think this is the way it will be because some precedents have been set with states doing it, um, this is how it, we think it might happen. It strikes me as the language of Nancy Pelosi when they um, passed the uh, Obamacare. What did she say? We have to pass the bill to see what's in it. We have to pass the bill to see what's in it. I'm telling you that's exactly what we're asking for when we're asking for a constitutional convention, a convention of the states, or whether you want to call it a convention to propose amendments. There's so much in this that leaves it open to interpretation, to ability to do whatever they want to do, that in order to find out what's going to happen, we have to do it. And once we've done it, once that convention takes over, it's too late. It's just like passing Obamacare. It's too late to see what's in it. It's going. Now, here's some other th interesting <coughs> aspects of of this, and, and um, was my good friend uh, Bruno Barron here today? Did he make it? No, he didn't. Okay. Well, uh, does anybody know what was on the agenda in 2010? Not just the election of the, uh, the uh, uh, officers and all of that here in the state of Illinois, but do you know what else was on? Do you remember what was on the ballot? There was a question. Every 10 years, Every 10 years, that question appears on the ballot according to our Constitution. That question is, shall Illinois have a constitutional convention? Yes or no? Every 10 years. It was on the ballot in 2010, whether you remember it or not or don't remember it. There was a lot of people, well-meaning people, that suggested that we need a constitutional convention here in the state of Illinois. And i got to tell you, we have probably one of the most horrible constitutions in this union. In fact, there, I, I don't know if you know it or not, there's an article in this Constitution that says nothing in this Constitution shall be construed as limiting the power of the legislature. Let that sink in for a second. You've got a Constitution that's supposed to be the supreme law of Illinois. But that supreme law of Illinois says nothing in this Constitution shall be construed as limiting the power of legislature. So it's not all powerful. The legislature is all powerful according to our Constitution. This Constitution.
Constitution needs to go away. It's horrible. Article 1, Section 22 is the kind of the Second Amendment of the Illinois Constitution. Although it's not an amendment, it's actually part of what they call kind of the uh, Article 1 is basically the Bill of Rights, right? The Second Amendment for the state of Illinois says, subject to the police powers, the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Can somebody tell me what the police powers are? This Constitution needs to go away. It's horrible. It's got a couple of bright spots in it. I mean, that whole definition of what a militia is is pretty cool. But there's some horrible things, and I agree, it needs to change. But I got to tell you, the, the Illinois State Constitution was ratified in what I call the dope smoking 70s. They had to be high to pass some of the stuff that was in this thing, right? But let me, let, let's think about it for a second. Even though it was the dope smoking 70s, there was at least a whole lot morality back then than there is today. There was at least a whole lot more conservatism back then than there is today. If we were to have a constitutional convention in the state of Illinois, what do you think that constitution would look like now? Pretty much pure and simple. I am absolutely abhorrent, given the fact that the mores of this country has gone down into the toilet. Who is going to be the ones in charge of making these laws to change possibly the structure of this country? If we were to do a state con uh, constitutional convention to change the structure in this state is tremendously frightening to me because I see the people who are trying to take control and they scare me. And I'm not a guy who's prone to fear. I'm a Marine. I don't mind looking the enemy in the eye and taking that shot. But what I see for this country doesn't scare me because of me. It scares me for my children and my grandchildren. We ought to be absolutely fearful of who would be on that convention sitting, making these laws. I know there's some, you know, Mark Levin put out that... Uh, um, liberty amendments thing, and I agree with most of his amendments. However, most of that's covered in our Constitution already. And the idea is, and I, here's the thing that blows me. I've gone to the website, and I've actually got the uh, uh, article out in, my, out in the car if you want to take a look at it. The problem, they say, the problem we face is that Congress is ignoring the Constitution. That's the problem. It's in the thing. It's the problem. They're ignoring the Constitution. And yet their solution is to make a more powerful Constitution. They're already ignoring it. They're ignoring it. So let's just throw some more stuff in there they can ignore. And then the coup de grace. We're going to trust the courts to do the right thing. The courts who passed Roe v. Wade. The courts who, when a Christian says, I don't want to sell you this cake, you, it violates my religious conscience to sell this cake or to take your photographs. And, the, and these courts are making up, violating the First Amendment. Yeah, you want to trust these courts to do the right thing? To say, okay, maybe they made a mistake in, the, in, in this convention, but the courts will protect us. The courts will protect us. Really? How well have they been doing that for the last 10 to 20 years? And you want to pass it to see what's in it? <laughs> Finally, one of the other things, and, and there's several other aspects of this, but um, the fail-safe. The fail-safe, according to the people that are proposing that, is let's say... Let's just say there was a runaway convention, which is actually what, what I believe will happen. There's a fail-safe that three-quarters of the states have to ratify the Constitution. And so they're not going to ratify something that makes it more horrible for this country, right? 
Really? How long have you been asleep? It's time to wake up and look what's going on around our country. The precedent, when they talk about precedent law, the precedents are being set. When's the last time a real conservative got elected here in the state of Illinois? We were hoping to get Chad, and I'm hoping that Tim, you know, will make a huge dent in this process by running as a write-in. Ronner, the Republican Party elected Ronner. In 2006, I ran as governor as a write-in candidate, receiving nearly 20,000 officially recorded votes with a name like Stufflebean. Okay, I had to teach people how to spell it, right? So the election judge would elect, at least count the vote. I got nearly 20,000 officially recorded. I was a nobody from Nowheresville that nobody knew. And yet I got that kind of response. Why? Because the Republican Party elected Judy Bartopinka, who was more liberal than Rod Blagojevich, and he's in jail! In fact, I think Quinn's about ready to head there, too, it looks like. <laughs> That's why I said it. You know, when I was running for governor, I'd only run, run, I'd only run one term. Second term's in jail, and I ain't doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but the fail-safe is that three-quarters of the states would have to ratify it, meaning 13 states would have to vote against it, basically. And the thing is, when we're seeing how many states are, you know, giving sanctuary to illegal immigrants, how many states are now have uh, homosexual marriages, how many states are infringing on the right to keep and bear arms, how many states are violating our property rights, how many states are violating all of these rights, and you want to tell me that 13 are going to oppose this garbage? As we see this thing drive further and further into the ground, people, you ought to be as afraid of this thing as I am. Because once it gets rolling, there's no coming back from it. The Second Amendment, gone. Right to property, gone. You think the UN wouldn't be interested in ensuring that they had certain representatives on this convention? Do you think that the Federal Reserve that banking cartel of the most powerful men in the world. Would you say, oh, well, just let's see what happens. <laughs> Hallelujah, brother. <laughs> People just have no clue as to how dangerous this single idea is because the money I've, I've had many good friends in this state run for office. I know their hearts were in the right place. I will take a stand for the Constitution when all others fail. And when they get swallowed up into the system, what happens? All of the Tea Party candidates of 2010, those constitutional darlings, Alan West, Michelle Bachman, and others, I can point to you where without exception, Every single one of them have voted for unconstitutional principles. Alan West, a, a part of the NDAA, which says we can arrest and detain people indefinitely without a warrant for arrest, voted for it. As long as people, and you're going to tell me that we can get people who have good under constitutional understanding, the kind of principles the kind of standards our founding fathers had. The United States basically understood these principles all across this land. They understood who God was. Even the guy they claimed to be a deist, Abraham, or, uh, Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson. Benjamin Franklin, he said, if I, seeing the revolution, he said, if I was an atheist, Having seen the providence of God through this revolution, I would now be a Christian. And he's the man that they all point to saying, he's a deist. He, he, 
basically he's not a Christian and all this stuff. But when you read the founding fathers, you see an entirely different story. And yet people who want this constitutional convention think that the more the people that have these mores up today, do you not think that the, the Federal Reserve, those banking cartels, the global elitists, wouldn't invest some money to make sure their guy was there? That's what made me afraid of the Illinois State Constitutional Convention. You think a billionaire like Ronner? How many of you have been receiving Ronner literature? I've gotten bumper stickers and I've gotten mailing. I mean, this dude is spending millions and millions of dollars and I'm not even a Republican. And I'm getting this trash. You think they wouldn't put this kind of money to make sure that their guy was seated at the table of a convention? Do you think that all these people would just say, okay, it'll be a fair election. We'll just let this one slide, you know? We'll make sure, well, no, no, we'll, we'll let those, you know, conservatives, you know, get their little piece of the pie for a little bit. And, you know, we'll, we'll just let it see, slide and see what happens. Really? Does anybody here, raise your hand if you believe that. Yeah, I kind of thought so. You guys looked intelligent <laughs> to me. You look like an intelligent bunch. So the idea is that you have to look at the reality and the circumstances of today. If this was the day of our founding fathers, well, not, number one, we wouldn't be in the condition, but let's just say we were, and our founding fathers, I trust them. I trust pretty much the American people because they understood those principles. They understood the principles of liberty. They just came out of slavery to the king. They understood it. Americans, by and large, in fact, it, um, Mark Twain, who was a humorist, um, kind of made it, his take on it was, it's not that the American people don't know anything. It's just that they know so many things that aren't so. The bottom line is, we have to be educated. We have to understand truth. We have to go back to the original documentations. And yes, it's going to take some work. But at constitutionallycorrect.org, I'm starting to try to do some of that work for you to make sure that you have available these documents so that you can actually read what the Founding Fathers have to say. And if I can get the funding one day, I'm going to have a commission that will, uh, what would be the word? Not necessarily translate, but it's kind of translate you know, the language. I grew up on King, the old King James stuff. I understand what they're saying, but a lot of people are like, yay, though, you know, you know, it's like, oh, I don't know what they're saying, okay? Uh, I would commission it so that it would make it much more readable for our, our common day Americans so that they can actually see it and enjoy it <coughs> and understand it to its full content. content. Uh, but the fact is, wherever you get this information, you need to be educated. I am here to stand for liberty. I am opposed to tyranny, and tyranny got its foothold in America in 1913 with the passage of the 16th, the 17th Amendment, and the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. Tyranny got its foothold in 1913. I am here to take a stand against that tyranny. I am looking for people to join me in that stand. I'm joining. If you would like to take that stand with me, Part, I'm going to administer the oath of defending and supporting our Constitution. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And part of that, and I'm going to caveat this with just one last thing. I was at a uh, place where I was speaking one time, and uh, there was a reporter there. And the reporter comes up to me and says, hey, hey, Randy, I've been all around here, and I've been asking people what it means to uphold the Constitution. <clears throat> what does it mean to uphold the Constitution? What does that mean? Most of them, I could see them kind of getting that deer in the headlight look and kind of like, it's the Constitution, duh. But really, what does it mean to uphold the Constitution? How many of you knew it was the state's responsibility to appoint officers in the Army? Okay, one. Well, my wife does. She's heard this many times. <laughs> the fact is, 
There's apparently some stuff in the Constitution that we all need to know and understand. So when I administer this oath, that upholding the Constitution, number one, means you've got to know what's in there. You've got to know what it means, number one. That's, and it's, you know, when our founding fathers wrote it, what was it, four pages? It's just not that long. It doesn't take, in fact, most of the time I read it on my way to, to my speech, so I've got the entire thing fresh in my mind. Read it, know what's in there, and then we can hold our politicians' feet to the fire. But what does that mean? What does it mean to hold our politicians' feet to the fire? Anybody? Address the grievances? How does that hold the fire, feet to the fire? No, I didn't say grievances. No, well, somebody said grievances back here. Yeah. How, how, does that, how does that hold their feet to the fire? You see something they're doing wrong, you have a way to make your point, and something to be done about it. But just making a point holds nobody's feet to the fire. <laughs> it's just your opinion, and they ignore it. We see that every day. Hey, you need to do this, and they go off and do something else. What does it mean to hold people's feet to the fire? This is a really important issue. Disenfranchise them at the polls. What does that mean? That's the best thing. Don't vote for them. Vote them out. There we go. Vote them out. <laughs> vote them out. <laughs> Elect somebody else. I was at another place. They said, can we sue them? Can, can we take them to court? No. Yeah, vote them out. Put somebody else in there. That's how we hold people's feet to the fire. We unelect them. Then they know there's consequences to their actions. Happened to West. Exactly. So if you'd all like to take the oath, if you'll stand. Raise your right hand. Your right hand, your other right hand. I state your name. I state your name. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend, that I will support and defend <laughs> the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. So help me God. So help me God. You are all defenders of the Constitution. God bless you, and let's stand to take this state and this country back. Yeah.